But this morning, I want to talk on be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. And I'm going to look at the life of Joshua. And I'm going to read out of Joshua chapter 5, I mean chapter 1, verse 5 through 9. And it reads like this. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I, I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Verse 6. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that it is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Father, we thank you, Lord. We ask you, God, that you would take full control, Lord. Let me step aside and teach and preach your word this morning, God. Let our hearts be open, God, for those that are watching are going to watch, God, on our YouTube and those that are here, God. Encourage us, challenge us, but more than anything, God, let us become more like you, Father. And we're careful to give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. And everyone said, Amen. So we're going to look at the story of Joshua here. Amen. And, and, and Joshua is best known as Moses' second in command who takes over after. Uh, remember Moses, he was supposed to take him into the promised land. But the first time the Lord told him, strike the rock, and he did, water came out. The second time the Lord told him, speak to the rock, and he struck the rock, thinking God was going to move the same way. And God says, okay, because you were disobedient, you're not going to go into the promised land. You're just going to see him go into the promised land. And that's where Joshua stepped in. Because Moses died, Joshua steps in and he takes the role of leadership. And, and, and Joshua is considered one of the Bible's greatest military leaders. For He, he led a seven-year conquest to the promised land. He's, for seven years he was in battle. He took leadership, but he led them into the promised land. So when we look at the book of Joshua, and we are able to see that people... Uh, they were redeemed from the bondage, amen, because of one man. Forty years after crossing the Red Sea, they were ready to cross over into the Jordan, into the land of Canaan, the promised land, in spite of Israel's murmurings and rebellions. Remember Israel, all they did was complain and murmur, God, why are you here? Why did you bring us to the desert? It was, we we're better off as slaves. And, but that was their whole routine. God would rescue them. They'd be happy for a while, and then they'd go back, and then they'd be bummed out again, complaining, God, this is happening. And, and so here we find out that God came, and He taught Joshua, and, and the primary lesson that we're going to look in Joshua's life is that God is faithful to His promises. And, and because the children of Israel, God had given them a promise that He would take them out of bondage and, and take them into the promised land. Just like you and me, God's given us a promise that He's going to provide everything we need, that He's going to use our life to do great things. But a lot of times we don't believe it because we look at our life and we say, God, but I'm like the children of Israel. I'm complaining when I go through hard times or I'm complaining when I, I get a, a doctor's call and it's bad news. God, why did this happen to me? Or, or I'm complaining when I pray for my children and they act up. Amen. And sometimes we're like the children of Israel. But God promised Abraham that his descendants will dwell in the land. And under Joshua, God brought the people into the promised land. But if you look at the life of Joshua, Joshua was born as a slave in Egypt about 40 years before the Exodus. So Joshua, he knew what it was to be a slave. He knew what it was to struggle. He knew what it was to, to live a hard life. Just like some of us here, we know what it is to struggle before we met God. We know what it is to, to be without. We know what it is to say, man, I, there's something more in my life. I, I'm missing something. And, and, and so Joshua, he fought the Amalekites as God had told Moses. And, and if we remember the story with Aaron and Hur and Joshua was fighting, Moses was on the mountaintop, he got tired, Aaron and Hur held up his arms, and every time they held up Moses' arms, Joshua was winning. And when Moses got tired, the arms were down, Joshua was losing. So Joshua knew what it was, amen, uh, uh, to do spiritual warfare. 
and, and he was right there besides Moses. And so the crossing of the Jordan River, the taking of Jericho, and then from there he divided the land into the tribes. Joshua died at the age of 110. That's a long life, 110. I mean, you know, I mean, we, we, we go past the 60s, uh, 70s, and then our body does things like, wow, you know, am I going to make it tomorrow, you know? And, but when you look at the Bible times, they lived a long time, 25 years after he entered the promised land. And so I have a question for us. Why does God use some people for his purpose and not others? Why does that happen? Why do some people are used and some people are not used? Because uh, uh, God does not want his kingdom to expand uh, uh, in certain places. God's selective in who he uses. Because there's a lot, everybody's called, remember that. Every one of us has something to do that God has called us to do. The Bible says that, that the call of God is irrevocable, that everybody, he gives something to somebody to do, whether it's out witnessing or whether it's just being an example to others. Hey, I love the Lord. It doesn't mean we're perfect, because as long as we're in this body, we're going to struggle. As long as we're in this body, we're going to have good days. We're going to have bad days. We're going to have victorious days. We're going to be in the valley some days. But as long as we're striving to do our best, that's all God asks from us. Amen? And so here we find out that, that a lot of people, they live without impacting others, because they don't want to give their best to the Lord. I, I'm just happy with just reading the Bible and knowing God a little bit and getting a goosebump once in a while and say, thank you, Jesus, I love you. And, and, and So they're not living the best because God saved us not for ourselves. God saved us for Him because He has something for us to do. And, and remember, the self, selfish wants to do everything that this, the body wants to do. Hey, go ahead and go here. Hey, go ahead and go that. Even though it's not good for you, go ahead and do it. So that's self. But when we learn that God saved us for others, we're going to start living our life for I can't do that because it's going to affect others. I, I can't talk like that no more because it's going to affect others. And, and so a lot of times uh, in our generation now, the normal seems to be just go to church and live how you want. That's like the normal for this generation now. And, and, and so our job as believers is to show them a different way. What I mean a different way is live your best for God. Because when we live our best for God, the love of God, and, and on Wednesday we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, so we talked about that agape love. We, we talked about the, the love, I mean, that covers a multitude of sins. So when we live for God and we live our best, then all of a sudden God is shining through us. This generation needs to see more men and women of God that let the light shine through them. Be an example wherever you go, amen? Because uh, even though people get you upset, that's God saying, okay, you're saying you live for me? Let me put you through a test. Let me put you around people that are going to get you angry. How are you going to act? Are you going to snap at them, or are you just going to say, overlook it and bite your tongue and say, God, I'm, I'm going to live for you, God. You're trying to build me here, and I, I recognize that you're trying to build me, God, so I'm just going to bite my tongue, Father, and just smile, amen. So here, even though Joshua lived a thousand years ago, amen, it still continues to impact millions of people. And so God's hand was on his life, and God, God's wisdom skillfully guided him. And, and when we read this story, God told him a bunch of times, uh, uh, be encouraged and don't be afraid. And I mean, no, because God's call is scary. It's scary to know that, hey, God saved us, and we're, and we're happy because we saved us. Oh, God, man, okay, this is good. Uh, uh, I, I, I feel something different on the inside. Then now he starts saying, live for me. And then what do you mean live for you? Well, I pray. Well, how do I pray for you? This is weird, you know. And, and then especially when you hear tongues, right? If you want to scare somebody, speak in tongues, right? Because you speak in tongues, you're like, oh, what's that language, you know? But then we're learning the difference in how to communicate with God. Then when we communicate with God... Then we're, we're, we're open and we say, okay, God, this, this is not that real because now I can feel you. Amen. That's living for God. And, and so God is still looking for men and women, young people, couples, to make themselves available for God. So the question is not about God's capability, but our availability. Are we available to be used by God? Are, 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 are we preparing ourselves and, and doing the necessary adjustments in us to let God flow through us. Because a lot of times we limit what God can do because we look at ourselves. 
when, when we look at ourselves, I mean, when I look in the mirror, I look, I said, man, how can God use somebody like you? You know, you, you still struggle with things. And, and that's why it's important to let God take control, to, to say no to those things that are going to mess us up or those things that are going to put us in a compromising position. So Joshua, what made him successful is he kept saying yes to God, whatever God asked him. And remember, now Joshua is at a place, it's his second time trying to lead the children of Israel. Remember the first time Moses sent them out as spies? Go spy out the land. And, and, and he said 12 of them, 10 of them came back negative. Two came back positive, Joshua and Caleb. But the 10 negative, they swayed the whole children not to go in. So Joshua's first attempt at trying to lead the people failed. But now he's at a place here where he's got to come again and God is saying, hey, you, made, you, you failed the last time but hey, I want you to try it again. And how many know that's a scary feeling that when God says, hey, you tried to live for me, you tried your best. Yeah, you made a mistake, but don't stay stuck in that mistake. Pick yourself up and try it again. That's a scary feeling. God, but I can't do that. And God, I can't speak. When I got saved, I, I couldn't speak. I, I couldn't read. Uh, I did so many drugs and, and, and stuff, man, that I would stutter. And I did, my mind was toasted. And, and, and so it took me a while. I would say, God, you can't use me. And people would say, you're called. And I'm like, God, no, I'm not. I, I can't even read your word. And I got started with the kid's picture Bible. And I would read the picture. It wasn't accurate, but it was, I was trying to learn how to read. And, and then I got, back then it was cassettes. And yeah, I'm that old. It was cassettes. I got a cassette of the Bible, and I started listening to them, going through the Bible. I did everything on my part. And then God started restoring <coughs> my mind. Because a lot of times what we want to do is just say a simple prayer. God, help me, and think God's going to step in and zap us. And God says, you got to do everything on your part. You want to be obedient? You want to fulfill my call in your life? You want to do what I called you to do? Then you got to start by making right choices. And how many know making right choices sometimes is very difficult? You know, uh, God, I, that doesn't feel good. Right choices won't feel good at the time, but in the long run, they will benefit us. And so there's limited possibilities for our lives. And, and, and so Joshua was here, but the key to his success was not found in his abilities or, op or opportunities, it was found all in God. Joshua understood who God was. And because he understood what God, who God was, he believed God. And because he believed God, he was able to surrender everything to God. And so many times we mess up the Bible. What I mean by that, the gospel is simple. God says, trust me, and I'll do everything that I promise you through your life. Now the question is, do we trust Him? Do we trust Him enough to believe what His Word says? His word says that he didn't come, uh, 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 so, so he, or he came, amen, to give us victory, to give us authority, amen, to break the yoke of bondage, to take us out. So that means that if we got strongholds in our life, his word says that his power, when he rose from the dead, is within us, and that we have the power to break strongholds. Now, whether we believe that or not, that's up to us. Just because we don't believe it doesn't mean his word is not true. His word is true. When we learn to step into that, we're going to say, man, he's able to deliver me from my strongholds. He's able to deliver me from my bad, my bad habits. But a lot of times we don't believe that because we're, our flesh is stronger and we keep saying, God, forgive me. But we keep on doing the same thing over and over. When we look at the life of Joshua, Joshua was an ordinary person who served a great God. There was nothing special about Joshua. The only thing special was he knew how to trust God. There's nothing special about me. There's nothing special about you in the sense where God saved all of us. We were sinners. God saved us. But what becomes special is when we learn to do what God's called us to do. And when we find what God's called us to do, we're able to say, man, I'm happy doing this. Why? Because now you're living the way God wants you to live. Now you found your purpose. And when you find your purpose, there's a joy in doing what God's called you to do. I want to bring out a, a, four, a few things that Joshua understood. Number one, Joshua understood that God uses you despite your past. Despite your past. And that's in verse 5. He says, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I've been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. 
Joshua here, the Lord was encouraging him, saying, man, just like I was with Moses, in other words, telling him, I know you tried this before, but you failed. He says, but I'm going to use you in spite of what your past looks like. And when we understand that God is going to use us in spite of our past, and meaning in spite of our struggles and in spite of our shortcomings, God is still going to use us. When we understand Joshua's past, he came from a line of slaves, and, and, and Joshua knew what suffering was, and Joshua knew about everything it is to be a slave. Everything about Joshua's past spoke of hopelessness, and he was a prisoner of his past, but he overcame his past because he allowed God to build him for his future. So Joshua was courageous because he believed in God. How many know God still chooses people and shapes them into great leaders or great people to be used by God? The key uh, for each of them, and it was for Joshua, was his willingness to be obedient, was his willingness to be patient. How many know we got to be patient in God's process? Just because we say, God, I need you now, He's going to come in us and He's going to fill us, but that mean, doesn't mean we're not going to struggle. As long as we're on earth, in this earthly body, there's going to be a battle. He talks about that. Paul, he says, when I want to do right, I do wrong. He says, man, the flesh and the spirit don't like each other. They're going to fight each other. And the flesh is always going to tell you, you ain't got to do that. It's okay, just take one more drink. It's okay, just click on that again. It's okay, just tell them off one more time. But we, when we understand what the Spirit is, the Spirit is going to say, no, because I'm trying to be like God. So it's an important that, that, that there's going to come a time, amen, where you're going to have to say no to the flesh. You're going to have to say no to the flesh. So Joshua understood here that God uses him or uses us in spite of our past. The second thing is he understood he needed to seize the moment. He needed to seize the moment. And that's in verse 6 and 7. He says, be strong and courageous. Then he says, for you shall give this possession of the land which I swore to their fathers and give them. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which my Moses' servant commanded you. Do not turn from it from the right to the left so that you may have success everywhere you go, where he tells them, you shall. In other words, God was saying, now is the time. You shall give this people possession of the land. And, and, and just like us, just us coming to start a church in, in Fresno is not a co coincidence. Now is the time. Now it's time for us to seize the moment. God brings people in, amen, and, and then he said, gives them a purpose and then he tells them, reach out to people, bring people in. Why? Because you're seizing the moment, amen? That's why people bring new people here. And then when you bring people in the first time, you're like, man, I, I hope it's good because I don't want it to be like this, and then they're not going to have a good experience, you know? But God is the one that does the work, amen? And we just have to seize the moment. God uses those who seize the moments to be faithful. The most basic important lesson in our spiritual life is in Luke 25, 21. If you are faithful in a little, God will entrust you with more. So if we're faithful in the little, amen, and our reward for being faithful, God's going to give us more to be faithful in. Amen. And some people are afraid of the more. God, I don't want more, God. I just want to come and just do the little. I just want to show up, God, give a little here and go back home. And that's it. No, but God says when you're faithful, I'm going to give you more to be faithful in. Too many people are afraid of the more. When we trust in Him, He rewards our faithfulness. So Joshua sought to grow personally in whatever position God assigned him to. Amen. Not all of God's assignments result in promotion, but every new challenge revealed a, a little more of who God is. See, you know where faithfulness comes from? It comes from our character. From our character. That's one of the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. Amen. Because we could fake faithfulness for a little bit. Let me just show up and I'll be there. But in the long run, let's see if you're still faithful. If you're functioning in the fruit of the Spirit, if it's in your character, you're still going to be here. But if it's not in your character, there's going to be patterns. How many know every one of us has patterns in our life? Every one of us. And if you're around us long enough, we're going to understand that pattern. We're going to see that pattern. And our role is not to point out your patterns. Our role is to preach the gospel, even to teach you what the Word of God says Amen. That way you can bring change because you have to make the choice. Our role is just to teach it. So Joshua's obedience led him, 
uh, to the leadership position where he was able to let him, lead him into the promised land. Joshua never set out to be a leader. He was a servant. Let me just serve my leader. He was serving Moses. That's all he was. He was just being faithful where he was at. Just like us here. We come every Sunday. We come Wednesday. We're just being faithful at where we're at. And when God sees that faithfulness, he says, okay, now I'm going to promote you. I'm going to put you to another place. Amen. So Joshua, he was just being a servant. Now God says, it's your time. It's your time, Joshua. And Joshua stepped up. Amen. Joshua was obedient to that. He, he seized the moment. Number three, Joshua understood he needed God's presence. And that's in verse 8. A said, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. See, the Lord was saying, hey, just like I was with Moses, you need all this. But he said, hey, the book of the law shall not depart from my mouth. What are you saying? The word, my word. He said, meditate on it day and night. In other words, he's telling Joshua, the only way you're going to be successful Amen. If you understand, you need me in order to fulfill what I called you to do. We can't do God's purpose on our own. We can't. I can't do God's will on my own. I will fail. But knowing that God uses me and God called me, I'm like, okay, God, my job is just to surrender to you. Surrender my junk. Surrender everything I have and let you flow through me. That's all God requires from all of us. Just surrender what we have. Good, bad, and ugly. Oh, it's not like a Clint Eastwood movie, huh? And our job is just surrender that part, man, to God. And, and, but a lot of times we're like, God, I struggle with it. God says, I know what you struggle with. Your job is just give it to me and don't take it back. Because a lot of times we give it to him, and then when we walk out of his presence, we take it back with us. And God is saying, no, no, no. Your job is leave it here with me. I know you struggle in that, and I'm going to help you, but you got to let me help you. Leave it in my hands. A lot of times we put it in God's hands, and then we take it back out of His hands. We need God's presence. Joshua had something else these leaders lacked. He had God's presence. He inherited a huge assignment. Amen. What Moses did, Moses was the greatest leader at that time. Now Joshua was here, and imagine Joshua, how can I step in his shoes? You know, we can't step in the next person's shoes. When they sent us out from our, our mama church, a lot of the people were like, how am I going to step in your shoes? I can't. I said, you're not responsible to step in my shoes. You could only step in your shoes. And when you step in your shoes, God anoints you when you step in your shoes, not my shoes. My shoes are my shoes, just like you here. You're not going to be who I am. You're going to be who you are. And when you understand who you are, you're going to be the best because God created you just the way you are. So why did God allow Joshua to accompany Moses to the mountain in, verse, in Exodus 24? Did, Josh, did Moses need Joshua to care? No. God allowed Joshua because he wanted Joshua to see the intimate relationship Moses had with God. That's what it is. The intimate relationship with him. You see, walking with God is not about a method. It's about a relationship. Because all of us can quote scripture. All of us can say, God, I love you. Yes, but are you living for Him? Because if we're living for God, something has to die in the flesh. Maybe anger has to die. Maybe selfishness has to die. Uh, 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 maybe attitude has to die. Amen? He says in verse 5, I will not leave you nor forsake you. See, he could have promised Joshua victory. Like, Joshua, I'm going to give you victory. Don't worry about it. He could have promised Joshua, I guarantee you protection and wisdom. But he didn't say that. God, God was not giving a gift. He was giving himself. He says, I'm going to be with you. Not my protection, not, not the gift of wisdom, but me, I, myself, God, the great I am, is going to be with you. And that goes for us today, that whatever we do, God is with us. Everything he possessed, power, authority, dominion, is in us. Why? Because he's with us. So God wasn't giving him a gift. He was giving him himself. When you know God is with you, amen, all fear will leave. When we know everything God has is with us, you're not going to be afraid no more. Fear is going to hit you for a moment. Oh, God, I don't know if I can do it. But all of a sudden, the spirit takes it away. Fear, get away from me because God didn't give me a spirit of fear but love power and a sound mind. So God, I understand that fear has to leave because God, you're with me. Now, number four, Joshua, he needed to be obedient to God's will. 
obedient to God's will. And that's in verse 8b. After God told him, man, hide my word in your heart, let meditate on day and night. Then he says, so that you may be careful to do according to all that it is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. See, he needed to be obedient. And, and the Lord was telling Joshua, when you hide your word, and when you live and you're obedient to my word, he says, then you, your ways are going to be prosperous. Then you will have success. And then to accomplish what God called him to accomplish. So how do we have success? Living God's word. Does that mean we're perfect? No. It means we're living our best. My best is different from your best. Remember that. So don't ever judge anybody. Oh, look, you made a mistake again. No, that may be their best. You know, just let them give their best. Because remember, God's grace and mercy steps in. And when we understand God's grace and mercy, He says, okay, give me your best and you're still learning, but my Holy Spirit's teaching you. And when you make a mistake, don't get discouraged. Take my grace and mercy. Pick yourself up and go forward. Amen. Which all God is asking us is to be obedient to what I called you to be. And we don't start off like on the mountaintop. When I got saved, I, the first year I was still struggling smoking. I was still struggling and my wife didn't even know I was smoking. You know, and I would hide my cigarettes in the trunk under my spare tire, and my radio stations were different. So when she got in the car, it was Christian, so she didn't know nothing that was going on, you know. And I was just doing my thing. But then I started getting around men of God. They started taking me to prayer. They started teaching me how to read the Word of God. Started saying, hey, you need to read books. I hated to read, but now I love to read, man. I got so many books. And, 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 and so I say that to say this. When you're obedient to the God's Word, God grows you. He grows our mind because we don't start off with a hunger for God. We're just excited that we found something new. God, I'm happy, God. You took all this hurt and this pain away. I'm happy. But then we don't start off, oh, God, I'm bad. No, that's a passion that has to come. And I was, okay, God, we got to go to, I'm just showing up to church because I need change. You know, when I got saved, we already had three kids. I was, I was 21. We were already married a year. I had three kids already, or 22, 20, my wife gave me a sign, or I had two kids. I don't know. Three kids. How many kids do we have, girl? Now just joking. <laughs> <laughs> we got three kids, but we got saved. We were young still, and, and, and so, but we got married young, you know. My wife met me and seen me in the boulevard. She couldn't let me go, and four in the morning, she asked me, what's your number? Got my number three months married. We got, uh, three months later, we got married, you know. <coughs> January will be celebrating 44 years of marriage. Who would ever thought, you know, after she, she couldn't let me go, you know. Boy, look at her, she's laughing. She knows the truth, though. Amen. <laughs> but how many know all God wants? God does not take second place in anyone's life. The Bible says he's a jealous God. Amen. So he has to be put first. And, and, and so when we understood that, all that stood between God's people and God's promises were their obedience and how many know that's all that stands between our promises and God is our obedience to Him. Amen. And remember, everybody's obedience is different. For some people, the, their best is showing up to church uh, uh, one Sunday a month, and that's their best for that time. Amen. And the mistake we can do is, oh, you got to be there again. You're a sinner. And then we discourage them. No, let them give their best. And I'll come, okay, then the next thing you know, a month later, they're coming two Sundays. And a month later, they're three Sundays. Before you know it, they're here all the time. Amen. That's their best, where they're at. Amen. So a lot of times we do the opposite. And when we don't do it out of spite. We just want them to have something better. And, and, but yet what we're doing is we're shoving it down their throat instead of letting God do the work. God is the one that does the work. All we got to do is model His love for them. And when we do that, we're going to see that we're going to make it easier for the world to see something different in our life. So here we find out that obedience is the key. For 40 years, Joshua witnessed the firsthand the consequences of disobedience. Because remember, 40 years they wandered in the desert. Why? Because they were disobedient. God told them with Moses, go to the promised land. And they said we couldn't do it, so they were disobedient. So Joshua seen what disobedience does. Why did it take 40 years? Because if you read the story, God was saying, okay, only Caleb and Joshua were the ones that said yes. All the leaders that said no in those 40 years, they died in that desert. That's crazy, huh? So that tells us when we don't say yes to the promises of God, we may not die physically, but spiritually we die. 
What do you mean? All of a sudden, your heart gets callous. All of a sudden, your heart gets hard for God. Now you don't care no more how you live. And when you have a callous heart, you want both worlds. Yes, God, I want you. I want to show up. But yet when you leave and you go home, you do all the things that separate you from God and you don't see nothing wrong with it. That's a callous heart. But when you understand, God, I've seen what the desert did to me, God. I don't want to experience that no more. Imagine Joshua and Caleb for 40 years. They had to wait for everyone that was negative. God took them out. I would have said, God, let me help you. Let me take some of them out for you, man. I want to get to the promised land faster. But they just had to wait. Imagine the children going through it. Are we there yet? How many have been in a car with your kids, your grandkids? Are we there yet? You, you just went one block. Are we there yet? Are we there yet, Grandma? Are we there yet? Uh, one, man, I, oh, just when we get there, I'll tell you. And that's the way the kids were. But guess what happened? After all the leaders died that were negative, now the children were at the same place that their parents said no to. Now they were faced with a choice. Do you want to go to the promised land? And how many thank God that the children said yes? How many know that, that, that sometimes we are the key for the ch our children, our grandkids, our great-grandkids getting into the promised land by the choices we make? Don't let them fight your demons. You look at David and Goliath. That was Saul's battle, Goliath. But he was afraid. So who had to fight the battle? David. The next generation had to fight the battle. If Saul would have took care of the giant, that gen the next generation wouldn't have to fight that battle. So some of us, we have to fight the battle, amen, and kill the Goliaths in our lives for our children won't have to fight that battle. So I'm going to close in verse 9 where he, where he says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's our promise. Be strong and courageous. Wherever you go, wherever it is, you go to the market, be strong and courageous. Amen. Let the joy of the Lord, let the love of God shine through you. All you got to do is just keep the joy of the Lord. Smile at people. Amen. And Hey, Jesus loves you. That's all you got to say, you know. Instead of being mad all the time, people look at you like, what you looking at? Like, err, you know. And, and just learn to smile at people, you know. It is. I remember when I first got saved, we were in the market, and I looked at a little kid like that, and the little kid got scared, and the Lord says, you got to smile at people. That's how he started doing something like, I'm trying to smile, God. I'm, I'm trying to smile, you know. And, 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 and my smile just ain't good for pictures. I, mean, I try to smile. And I remember I was with my, my grandson, and his mom tells us, I'm trying to teach him how to smile. And then we took a picture together, and I'm looking at my smile and his smile. They're both the same. I said, he's never going to learn it. <laughs> he's got my smile for pictures. It's never going to come out, amen. But here, God is encouraging us. No matter where you go today, throughout the rest of your walk with the Lord, He's saying, have I not commanded you? You know what a command is? It's an order. He said, I'm telling you, be strong and courageous. That's what He's telling He's coming. He's not saying, hey, if you want to. No, He's giving an order. Hey, I'm with you. Be strong and courageous. He says, do not tremble or be dismayed, for God is with you wherever you go. See, he's saying, hey, why are you asking, why are you acting fearful? Why, why, why are you scared or scared or whatever you want to call it? I'm with you. Why are you acting like that? I'm commanding you. Yeah, you may have got a bad report, but I'm with you still. Yeah, you may be praying for your kids and they're getting... But I'm with you still. Yeah, you're trying your best, but everything's falling apart. Don't... I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Those watching on our YouTube, be strong and courageous because God is with us. So I want to close in a word of prayer this morning. And I want to encourage you that whatever you're facing here this morning, if you need prayer, we're going to pray. We're going to ask God to strengthen you. But I want to encourage you, be strong and courageous. Father, we thank you, Lord, this morning, my God, for everything you're doing, Father. We pray you seal this word in our heart, my God, even for the new people we have here this morning, for the new people that are watching on our YouTube, God. We pray your Holy Spirit would just lift their spirits up. Encourage them, God, that everything is going to be okay, God. 
that you are with us, my God. Whether we're on the mountaintop or we're, whether we're in the valley, we come against the enemy that is trying to discourage your people. We pray, my God, a hedge of protection around them. We pray a renewed mind, Father God. We pray a strength, God, for those that are feeling weak. Your word says when we are weak, you are strong, Father. Holy Spirit, I pray that this will be the best day of our life, my God. And that wherever we go, God, we will let your light shine through our lives, God. And that we understand and we take advantage of this time, Father. Because you are coming soon, Lord. And Father, we're careful to give you all the glory, honor, and the praise, Lord. We love you and we thank you, Lord. In your Son's name, amen and amen. God bless you and thank you. Amen, those that are watching.